Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Star Sound Speaks, episode 245. And it's eclipse season. As promised, Andrea Michelle is with us for taking us through both the solar and the lunar eclipses. If Andrea looks familiar to you from, yes, she's been on, I think it's been, this is your third visit. And she's certainly been on Astrology Hub, and you probably recognize her as one of the guides in the summit. And her website is called Precious Human Birth. So as you can guess, the gist of her work here, soul and heart-centered astrology. If you're new to the channel, uh, welcome, welcome. My name's Irliana Samsara with Star Sound Astrology. I do Hellenistic and modern astrology blended. This episode is going to be dedicated to the solar eclipse. Andrea is going to come back for another episode later in, in a few weeks. We'll follow up with the lunar eclipse delineation. This solar eclipse, huge for the collective. I see it for the United States, 29 degrees of Aries. Why is this eclipse so pivotal? Okay, this eclipse specifically, and then I'll speak a little bit to the whole, like, like we were sharing post or pre-show about the whole instinctual intelligence thing. 29th degree of a sign, of course, is the anorectic degree. It's very uncomfortable. It's kind of, it's where we have the accumulated wisdom of the sign. So we kind of don't want to let go of what we know. It's like the, the point where we may not be ready to jump into the next sign. So there's a lot of uh, subconscious controlling that happens there. And for me, it's <laughs> much about, you know, Aries is associated with the head. So we're really seeing how much we are head oriented and assuming that our intelligence is just based sim simply, we're disconnected in our heads from our bodies. And that's yes. one of the things that the eclipse will show us because it's literally the moon, which is an aspect of our body and, uh, and our ego structure is eclipsing the solar life force. So we're seeing how much of our life force is eclipsed by being in our heads constantly. Mm. There's no life force in our heads. We literally have to suppress the natural wisdom intelligence that flows uncontrolled in us as us in order to maintain an ongoing separation, Chiron and Aries, to remain in our heads only to know ourselves, to orient ourselves. And with Mars as the ruler of this eclipse, being in Cancer, which we're going to go into a little bit, where are we still acting from our emotional body? Where are we still reacting from our emotions, taking our emotions as the be all and end all of things, or how we identify ourselves, making our context more important than the content of who we are beyond simply our emotional reality, mm. our tribal differences, our faction, factionalizing and, and whatnot. So again, this eclipse for me is highlighting so much of where we are still really holding on to our heads and the disassociated masculine, which as we talked about earlier, I see with Chiron is a, is a constant theme in, in Aries still, and will be for another until 2027, very much showing us where we are running on fumes in our masculine because we are so disconnected from the source. And I call Chiron and Aries and all the Aries action from that place when we're taking it from that place as the mercenary. It is not acting on from the deeper strata of our being, but acting from a place, literally, I see it as like a pinball within this funhouse matrix, which isn't so much fun, of simply our head as the context rather than our hearts, our bodies, wisdom, the lower para, whatever, that wisdom. So this eclipse season is opening us into a reality check mm. of where we are disassociated from reality. We can't forget Siren, uh, Saturn in Pisces either, right? So dissolving the matrix of belief and everything that we believed about real that we thought was real. Uh-huh. Yep. So those of us who are going to continue to consciously or unconsciously perpetuate a victim mentality, we're going to double down. We're going to believe the fear that Chiron, especially, I'm sorry, that Saturn, especially in Pisces, can be this nebulousness of fear, kind of being overtaken by the fear, the false fear matrix that we are all living in, which I'll get to in a minute, or we can use it to cut or to consolidate reality 
from what's not real because the Pisces is the collective unconscious. So right. to get more honest, to initiate us into strengthening us into feeling, bumping up against the boundaries of what's the false reality and what is the true reality within each of us. It plays out externally, but it also has its complement internally. And we tend to forget. We tend to always see life as playing out outside of us, which is what fosters and perpetuates victimhood. Things are happening to me. So again, Chiron and Aries, and part of this whole Aries matrix is, where do I not want to take responsibility for my own choices? Where am I remaining a victim? Mm -hmm. Especially Chiron squaring Mars and making it about my, I'm hurt, my emotion, emotional wounding, rather than I don't know where I'm choosing from, but I want to get more accurate series in Virgo around where I'm maybe complicit, mm -hmm. not at fault, but complicit simply by virtue of the fact that I'm choosing from an unconscious place, choosing from a victim place, not choosing, which is a choice in and of itself, and just deferring, kind of walking right. through, letting life happen to me. Right. And acknowledging first where I haven't been choosing. That's the, the road to a, a deeper availability, potentially, to actual choosing. Here's the chart for Washington, D.C. Everything you were just saying about being cut off from our heads and playing victim and, and Saturn and Pisces. Look at where Saturn and Pisces, angular fourth house for the United States. Talk about moving the foundations of where we, of the reality structure that we operate from. Of course, for me, and I know it was for you too, we were talking about how the ruler of this eclipse is Mars and Cancer exactly conjunct the USA sun. The USA sun being July 4th, country 13 degrees of cancer this is a choice point you were saying earlier when we were chatting you were talking about the vital intelligence that this eclipse speaks to the vital intelligence of our instinctual nature because of mars aries right instinct you brought in the reptilian mammalian brain how our limbic system has been hijacked by fear and tribalism and we know when it's time to fight or rest or when it's time to fight or flee when it's time to rest or digest, that's been hijacked. So this is what's come. I'm getting chills just saying this to you. This is it, man. This is all of this is going to be in our face for the whole world, certainly. But this is going to play out really strongly in the United States, especially because of that Mars. The ruler is sitting on Sirius as well. Yes, the Isis star. Yes, the star of the, sem the feminine mysteries. And um, yeah. So the real ISIS, the feminine mysteries, not the yes. bad guys that have no, 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 no. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So for me, very much, I've been really, really coming into how, and not because I'm downloading this, but because I'm doing my own work in the going deeper into the places in me where shadow lives, where these this programming lives in me, where the hijacking is taking place in my own body that's giving me some intimations of the importance of the wisdom intelligence of our intrinsic instinctual nature, awakening our innate intelligence to connect back to nature, which we are endemically wired to do. And I gave you the example of the, the Bushmen of the Kalahari, right? Right, yes. So, or literally, they are so attuned to the intelligence of nature because they're attuned to it in themselves didn't you say even the footprint like they're they're actually yeah, the tracking yes they're communicating with the footprint of the animal not that the animal's there but they actually tune in and they the energetic frequency of the animal that's left in the footprint and the field you know it's like the the, the morphogenetic field as rupert sheldrake writes which is a fascinating his work on the morphogenetic fields is it's a whole thing highly recommended but we all have this. And so what we were talking about before the show is Eris is conjunct this eclipse. Eris is going to be a huge player in the coming Here she is. year or more because the North Node is going to meet her. And she's having her nodal return this year too, which that's a whole other topic. But my point is she is what I call, 
she is the goddess devoted to remembering our wholeness. And when I say remembering, I mean, remembering what I refer to as the triune brain, mm -hmm. which is the neocortex, the mammalian brain, and the reptilian. And what is the reptilian brain? It is, again, our situating ourselves in our environment so that we know when it's time to run. And when we know when it's time to rest and reset or receive or digest as it, as it were. And we are so Chiron and Aries, just running on fumes going, but we don't know how to rest and reset anymore. And this is what, for me, Ceres in Virgo retrograde is inviting us to. The wisdom intelligence of receiving, the wisdom of the self-accuracy that Virgo provides for us there's so much more but there's series up in the 10th house for the usa chart this is going to be a very public transformation potential yes yeah but each of us individually is responsible for our own part in this and this is where chiron and aries can continue to make it about what's happening outside being more important than what's actually what am i choosing inside internally because the wounding of Chiron and Aries, whether we or not we have it by natally or not, we all are somehow wounded in our masculine. And the masculine, when it's disassociated from the feminine, becomes the mercenary. It's just acting and fighting, and it doesn't know what it's fighting or protecting or acting on behalf of. So just to, just to sum up this limbic mammalian thing, the reptilian brain, again, knowing when to flee, knowing when to stay. The mammalian brain, caring, creating a nest. Why is he cancer? Finding our tribe, knowing ourselves situated in our tribe versus, or dependency, natural dependency. I need you for certain things that I can't do on my own. That gets hijacked to codependency. I'm owed. I can't do it on my own. All very subconsciously. This is in every one of us in our own ways. And fear. So those natural responses in us that I shared a minute ago of our reptilian and our mammalian brains, because we are so up here focused and not in our triune brains anymore, or very few of us, doesn't mean we can't be again. This is what the invitation is. We have this programming, this whole fear programming that we are living from. And we are operating out of this disconnected place through our emotions. So Mars and cancer, are we acting from our emotional anger or hurt or woundedness, Mars square Chiron here, or are we choosing the vulnerability of, wow, I don't know where I've really been choosing from. I don't know if I've really been choosing. Right. Or what, on what level am I choosing? And is it in alignment with me and my center, my heart, son? Or is it in alignment with my false safety matrix, moon, that I have just automatically assumed is who I am? When it's only one small component and the moon and the sun together in an eclipse whether it's a solar or a lunar eclipse, is reconciling where I polarized myself and made me personal, moon, but not become intimate with the context, solar, sun, with which the personal is embroiled, embedded, and enlivened by. So this is how much are we still in our heads and reactive? How much are we available to make to return to and be magnetized back into our hearts as uncomfortable as it might be as much as the self-accuracy piece or you know different aspects are going to show us ooh, i don't want to feel this but it's important to get honest and accurate with what we've been choosing in order to really really be able to choose differently otherwise we're perpetually going to be choosing the same thing even if it's masked in a new costume right because that 29 aries it's like it, it very much it's also known as a karmic degree so this is a really important lesson that we that's being presented to us and we really are at that evolutionary crossroads 
I know you had mentioned there's a fixed star, Surma. I've never heard of Surma, but you said it is conjunct the south node. Surma is uh, four degrees of Scorpio. And you said that you called that an Atlantean star? Ah, yes. I didn't call it that. Nick Fiorenza. I, re I resonate a lot with what Nick Fiorenza, who is unfortunately passed, but he has a, a book that you can still get on lulu.com. Mm -hmm. It's called Astronomical Astrology. And he speaks of Surma as the Atlantean star, because to him, Surma is all about where we are still holding traumatic experiences deep in our cellular wiring as a human species around past cataclysmic events. With Mars being the traditional ruler of Scorpio in the sign of cancer, there's these old stored Genetics. traumas. Exactly. And then 13 degrees is also serious. So yeah. there is this, you know, this speaks on a really high cosmic level too. If we're going to tie in serious, mm -hmm. maybe this is feeling like this disconnect from our real home, like our star mm -hmm. home and, mm -hmm. and this opportunity. So as we come together to to heal this what you call the triune brain of uniting what has been so cut off of all these aspects of ourselves and aspects of our brain and literally our brain and, and then just the the world brain if you will and this is this opportunity to um i feel that th this is so important especially the pluto at zero aquarius you know looking at all that chat gpt and all that insanity that has been accelerated and we know that but the fall of Atlantis was technology out of control. So it is it it speaks to to that as but very much so this this thing that you said about the head and Aries and the head and the and the 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 merging of of these all these aspects of our brain and making them whole and not going in those steps of Atlantis because that's what happened in Atlantis, right? People they, they everybody got in their head and went into the technology and that outpaced spirituality and it can never, it's never supposed to, right? Yeah, it's supposed to always, right. Kabbalah speaks of that. Technology must always keep pace with spirituality. You know, if if it overtakes it, which is what has been happening, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. destruction. And so we have a choice to make here. I love when you talked about the Kalahari Bushman, you also mentioned My Octopus Teacher, that documentary, and Wim Hof, we also, we also mentioned Wim Hof. So tell us about the octopus teacher and why do you feel that, that the lessons in that, in that documentary reflect what this eclipse is ah, on? Thank you, I will. If I may just circle back really quickly to what you beautifully shared about the choice point. Pluto squaring the nodes. We have an, this is literally a choice point. Do we go back to what we've been doing, even if we're not conscious of? Going back to something that we've known, it's scary. In other words, are we still fighting something or are we choosing something different? There's a difference. Are we, are we still suppressing our life force to fighting systems that are outside of us? Which is really in one way, not wanting to deal with my own shadow or are we choosing to become vulnerable to where, what, is, what is mine to own? Not in the greater story playing out in the collective, but just my story. Where am I still suppressing my life force mm. for, for safety that is no longer necessary, for a form of safety? That's what the eclipse is awakening us into. Always about like, where have I been holding on to safety or definitions of safety that I'm actually available to, that I'm outgrowing now, but I'm still clinging. So safety in my head, in my in my mind only versus the intelligence of my body. So the North Node is on Sheraton. It supports new beginnings, adventure, transmutation, and great rewards. It impels us to initiate personal action to take the lead in our individual lives. So not to fall into the fear matrix of what's happened before, but just keep choosing. Even if it's, the choosing is to be self-accurate, to be honest with ourselves. That's the greater gift of this period and and then i know remember that um being here now i know with um ari moshe wolf when he shared about pluto and aquarius and and he was said how important that is that the being here now and i i feel like to tie that in when we are here in this moment then if we are being all of a sudden we find ourselves being run by these old instinctual programming cut off from our head and you know wanting to fight or 
fight or flight or whatever. It's like if we come down now into the and presence ourselves and get in our body and breathe, and then we're coming from this place of, of being in the now, that I feel that, that that's what unhinges that whole mechanism. What do you what do you think about that or any thoughts? I I think it does over time, but one of the most important things that we have to recognize, and this is the self-accuracy piece, is how much we are, how much safety is what runs us. We can't get away from it. Like simply, I, I love what you're saying and I'm in agreement. And the more human for me, compassionate and honest thing and what I do in my own practice is if I choose to be here and I catch myself leaving and I come back again and I catch myself leaving, the reality being honest with me is, wow, I'm not available or I don't want to stay just yet. That is the human capacity to claim where I'm at. That's really presencing ourselves. Yes. We can't go from A to Z without going through the whole spiral. Out, we go back in, we come out, we go back in. That's the intelligent wisdom of the spiral, which for me is so much about bringing together the, the timeless and the time and liminal linear. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But yes, my octopus teacher. So I was talking to you beforehand about how the popularity, and I love Wim Hof too, if anybody's heard of him. He's all about the cold and breathing. For him, for me, he has basically his hack is what the yogis of Tibet and you know have yeah. done, just like literally aligning the triune brain, coming back into the the cold as just one example, breathing, engaging, enlivening parts of ourselves that were asleep because we we're so deadened to always having to get some false measure of pleasure. But we don't, we become such hothouse flowers in a way that we don't remember that our body craves to be enlivened. And here brings me into, and again, all the people who, who've seen me say this before, I, I am like a broken record with this. I should get okay. permission for, for, for this. Right. this movie. But if you haven't seen it, please see it. In this movie, he talks about this man who forms this relationship with this octopus that he calls his teacher. He goes into the very, very cold waters. I think it's off the coast of South Africa. Day after day for a year. And he talks about how his body craved the cold after a year. And he didn't want to have anything. He didn't even wear a wetsuit. He didn't want to have anything that stood in the way between him and the immediate environment of the underwater sanctuary. And he talked about how his mind, his brain, different aspects of his being literally his physical, his physicality turned on from being in the very, very cold water. And to me, that's what made him particularly susceptible, available, vulnerable, open to the depths of what he learned and what he gave the reciprocal nature of the intelligent communication between him and this beautiful octopus. But not only that, he came to really, really appreciate the whole underworld environment because he wasn't separate from it. He was engaged fully. He didn't even have to think about it anymore. It's the intelligence of the instinct to know oneself situated in one's environment, still have boundaries when necessary, needing to flee if something should come. Absolutely. That doesn't mean just being open and like, oh, okay, oh, I'm going to be by the white shark that's coming my way. No, it's like knowing when it's time. Also knowing when maybe the shark is not about to get me, but just being like my wisdom, the instinctual wisdom that I am will let me know. Anyway, that's why I love this movie. It is so much speaking to what I'm talking about, about the potential that to ignite, to reignite, what is in, inherent in our birthright for all of us, if we're willing to let go of more of the, the head, the and really, really sink down into some of the uncomfortable, unpleasant places, the south node is still in Scorpio, and Pluto is right there squaring the nodes, 
getting uncomfortable to understand what real safety, what real comfort, what real ease North Node in Taurus actually feels like in our being that's not conditioned upon our emotional responses so much. And again, mm. it's always a spiral. There's always more. We do what we can. We take as much responsibility as we're available for in our moment with honesty, with kindness, with love, with self-respect. Until the next time. Wow. Oh, that, that was greatly channeled. I love oh. it. Oh. Mm. For our next episode, we're going to be doing the lunar eclipse and, and we'll certainly check in with each other. I know, and, and we'll, I know I, my invitation to everybody is we're all here for each other and uh, things that come up and to be raw and vulnerable with each other and engage like, you know, what Andrea, what you're saying about reconnect your head with the rest of your body. Uranus and Taurus has been wanting us for five years now, May of yes. 2018, right? When in, in feeling that and embodying that, embodying this wisdom and if we could just maybe take a quick trip through the zodiac first through the 12th houses so every the, the promise of what you've just shared so beautifully if people have this eclipse if they're aries rising or libra rising aries libra axis that would be first and seventh houses so if you could just kind of maybe we can walk through that quickly before we yeah, wrap this yeah. part of our journey up okay yes I'm more of a fine tuning into everybody's individual chart kind of gal. And there is still some uh, benefit to, to doing a, gen a general thing. So, I, and again, I don't use whole signs early on. I respect whole sign, but for me, the quadrant house systems are more, again, like, because Aries, the, the sun and moon are in Aries, but the North node, the nodal axis is still in Taurus and Scorpio. So right. maybe, this one, yeah, we haven't yeah. slipped um, into July is when we make that switch it's with the July is when we make the switch. Right. But it's um, yeah. So what's the first? The first three houses of the chart are the instinctual houses, no matter what the sign is. It's how we instinctually orient to ourselves. We can do it. How about we do it in a quadrant based? Sure. Way? Okay. Okay. The first three houses are the discovery of self. So how can we discover North Node ourselves in a whole new way? Whatever the signs, well, if the eclipses fall in your first, second, and third house, how are you discovering yourself anew? That would, in, that would imply that this is the instinctual signs within the instinctual houses, the discovery of self. So where can you get out of your head or even how you orient even subtly in your body, how you're controlling and contorting your body to hold yourself in a particular posture as a way of identifying who you are and where can you fine tune in your body through whatever methods you already have at your disposal, disposal, whatever tools, or seek out some tools to discover where you can, you know, it's the first three houses, so it's a lot more immediate. So as I was telling a client the other day, maybe go boxing or like, right. <laughs> you know, I don't know, like take a cold shower or whatever it might be, just enliven and awaken your body, right? The second quadrant, the fourth, fifth, and sixth houses is the exploration of self. So there's a discovery of self. I have a self. Wow. I can choose. I have agency, whatever. The second is the exploration of self. How do I use these choices? How do I use how I'm situating or whether I'm situating in my environment to come into a deeper engagement and make use of the resources that I'm discovering through this discovering that I have a self. How am I exploring how the energies of Aries, Aries and Taurus, how am I making use of these energies in my, in my life? in my understanding of myself, because we're still in the lower half of the, of the chart. And then we have the next three houses. Yeah, so now we're above the horizon, above the horizon. and we have the, the quadrant of discovering other. Wow, there's another. And even if we're completely other oriented, which most of us are anyway, where am I discovering other anew? Where am I discovering the other that lives in me? Is, is really how to make use of this. Because again, it's Aries and Taurus. So no matter what houses these fall into our charts, this is still, what am I choosing? What am I not choosing? 
where am I able to stabilize more in these new choices? Where am I becoming disabled, disstabled, <laughs> unstable in what I'm choosing? And I'm actually supporting an old way of knowing me, an old mechanism of safety, old orientations of what mm -hmm. I value and, and security. So where is other reflecting back to me opportunities to make new choices? And then we have the last mm -hmm. quadrant, yep, 10, 11, and 12, which is exploring other. So this is where we get to explore how we are maybe separate, maintaining separation from other. Because Chiron is in there too. Chiron's in here with, with all of this. Where am I hiding in secret, keeping myself hidden? from other, from exploring other in a way that's vulnerable and actually engaged. How much is my relating with other, and this is for, for both sides of the upper hemisphere, coming from a defensive posturing, even in unconsciously, rather than an open curiosity around what is this relationship? What is this relating all about? Where am I losing me in the relating with you? making it about the yumminess of the space, making it about melding with you or like finding where I'm situated in the group versus staying in me and letting me, my natural intelligence, show me where I am situated in my environment. Taking responsibility, agency to choose to know and discover other through my heart, wisdom, and intelligence. Because this is, we're talking about the eclipse after all. And again, the moon and the sun. Where can I bring in my old safety patterns that I'm now may no longer need into my heart to be loved, to open a window, which I won't know right away, into potential new choices, new levels of engagement, new levels of life force available to me when I am vulnerable and openly, but still with boundaries as necessary, available to engage. I hope that was- That was, okay. yeah. Okay. You're on a roll, man. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Woo, we got it done. Yes. This is so exciting. I, I really appreciate that everything you've shared because it really does you know, it can be very chaotic energy, any eclipse, but especially this one, you know, when you think about too, I mean, and I've said this on the podcast, for example, with the collective, like Joe Biden's health, there's been little reports that are seeping out and all. And, and so his health is just of a, of a great concern. And I, you know, I saw it when he got, you know, elected, many astrologers have talked about this, that, you know, this may not be a complete presidency for him. Not that I'm trying to scare anybody, but you know, this is life. This is part of life. And this this coming to be in the ebbing away and and so and change, you know, which is an and then very the very nature of, of our reality. And so uh, we could be seeing, who knows? I mean, a, there's our country's been so polarized. We this if he were to say leave office, maybe he might be ill and have to step down and have Kamala Harris take over. You know, these are things that I'm just going to say it, you know, like, look, we, we have to, we can't tiptoe around this. We're at a very critical place of choice. And I think that everything that you've just shared today on this podcast about, you know, embod all that wholeness, the heiress, you know, part of this eclipse, the triune brain coming into wholeness and embodying and, and making choices from that, because let's face it, if somebody leaves office suddenly, you know, or or something happens that's out of the norm. Yes, talk about, we talk so much about comfort, comfort zones today, totally throws us out of comfort. We're so wired to 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 be attached to comfort. And when things come along that that can upset the apple cart, you know, where that leaves us and, and how critical it is now to not be in that reactive, you know, Mars, right? Right on. Emo Mars and cancel, the emotional reactive state. Um, yeah. But coming from that higher place and, and and embodying all aspects of the brain, it's like that. That's the the path forward. Is 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 really being you are so grateful for you. Thank you. And yeah. one last thing with Ceres and ret retrograde in Virgo. She's the she's a co ruler of Virgo, 
one of the things in her higher aspect that she can be teaching us, it's accentuating the suffering that's happening right now. But Ceres is so much about suffering for a purpose, not suffering as a victim. If Are we embroiled in with Mars and with all the Pisces going on and Mars and Cancer and the emotional waters, are emotions running us from that place of hijacked mammalian brain? Or are we going to acknowledge suffering is a part of what it is to be human but when we not take it personally, when we act upon it or engage in it as an initiation, which to me is so much series about our human initiations, that is the beginning of empowering ourselves to having our suffering count for something. Then we are suffering in a more from a more empowered place. And we recognize Virgo is also about cycles, our own timing and timing. That when we're run by fear, which we all are, we can't just in our heads choose, okay, I'm not going to be run by fear anymore. To get to where we can honestly have a new choice, we have to drop down to the place where the fear programming lives in us. And there are people who are doing this deep, deep level of work. It takes more than just Therapy, those of us who really, really want to get to where we can make these new empowered choices, find a practitioner, find someone who's doing their work that can just be a mirror and a space in which we can more honestly really engage in the deep work that's really being called for us now because the, the opportunities are, there's so much grace available too. There is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful and Certainly um, looking forward to our next episode where we will be delineating the lunar eclipse. And again, precioushumanbirth.com is Andrea's website. Please let us know how you're doing. Leave your comments below what you think of this. Uh, please like, share, subscribe. Always helps the channel. Well, thank you again for joining us. And I will see you for that lunar eclipse very, very soon. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Always so much fun and goodness to be with you. Thank oh, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, my dear. Well, all right, everybody. We will see you next time. Thank you again. This is Irliana Samsara and Andrea Michelle. Star Sound Speaks, Star Sound Astrology, PreciousHumanBirth.com. We'll see you soon. Take care now. Bye. Yeah.